Does that help? Yeah, yeah, there we are. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I think it's still, uh, is it morning by you still? Uh, I think it's still morning. So, uh, good morning, Texas. Uh, you need any ballot counters? <laughs> uh, not, not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for that presentation. It's fascinating because uh, I would say that uh, I knew a lot about Willis, but I learned a lot of new stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had an amazing, amazing career. And his youth is so fascinating because he's an army brat. And I didn't know that he attended that many schools. Oh, yeah. Know, my goodness. And, uh, you know, uh, that made him sort of very focused on himself, which made it possible for him to do that stuff with Lovecraft, which is amazing that as a 15 year old, he would correspond with this rather difficult man, you know, and they became friends. Uh, Willis and I became friends via the telephone uh, you remember telephones? Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, Willis, called because he knew that of my European background, he would call me to check on pronunciation of musicians' names and also sometimes the names of pieces of music because he was so extraordinarily uh, focused on being accurate. You know, he addressed a worldwide audience and he did not want to mispronounce somebody's name or, you know, uh, be anything. He was a perfectionist in, in many ways. And that was one aspect of it. So he would call me sometimes and say, you know, how do you pronounce so-and-so? And with me, it was mostly German and Scandinavian. I wasn't too good on Slavonic names, although sometimes I could help a little bit with that too. Uh, anyway, uh, that was kind of, you know, impersonal, but we, we, we came to meet. I, I don't remember where we first met and when, but uh, certainly Newport was part of it. And of course, Willis was for a while uh, the master of ceremonies at the Newport Jazz Festival. And he was, I have seen literally, I wouldn't say hundreds, but dozens and dozens of MCs at various festivals in various countries. He was the best. He was absolutely the best. Because again, he paid so much attention to detail and accuracy and also his way of speaking, which came from his broadcast experience, was so precise and so he you know it's not only that he never mispronounced anything but it was so clear what he said when he introduced musicians announced the names of pieces performed and so on and at the same time he wasn't he he wasn't overly uh, stiff or convention he was uh, he was also uh, he had personality and uh, he was the best MC that the festival ever had. I think something, you know, things happened. I think something happened between Willis and George Wynn. I haven't had a chance to check George's autobiography, but anyway, he, you know, he left after a while. There was some, there were things that happened internally at the festival, uh, but he continued to serve as, uh, as an MC. And then of course he produced his own, festival. And uh, the one uh, in DC uh, was a cause of some unpleasantness, uh, which I, uh, as editor of Downbeat at the time, uh, played a certain peripheral role in. But that was when Holly West, who uh, was the uh, the jazz writer for the, was it the Washington Post or was it the, the Journal or what, what was it? Uh, uh, whichever major Washington paper uh, attacked Willis for having too many, you know, roles to play in the Washington DC jazz world. And it was totally unfair. And I chimed in on that. The only time I ever wrote an editorial in Downbeat, I did two editorials, 
but in this particular case, I did in, in defense of, uh, of Willis. It was a totally unfair attack. But let us say here that Willis played a very significant role in the eventual uh, allocation of funding uh, to jazz by the National Endowment for the Arts. And I have some personal experience of that because I was on an early jazz panel when they first brought in jazz. In the beginning, there was no room for jazz. And uh, uh, when someone suggested internally at the endowment that they should consider jazz, uh, one of the classical people said, jazz, why that's a music played in nightclubs. <laughs> That was the attitude, that was the attitude. But Willis was one of the people who worked behind the scenes and eventually there was an allocation for jazz and it grew and grew and eventually became very respectable. Uh, so this is one of the many things that uh, Willis accomplished for the music aside from his service on the Voice of America, which was immense. And you mentioned uh, Poland and Hungary. Hungary in Poland when he first went to Poland, you know, he was received at the airport like a you know uh, like a movie star, and uh, he he was practically a, a you know a national figure, and he was so important. What he did was so important to the globe. Poland became a very important European jazz country. They produced a, a lot of good musicians. And that was very much Willis's groundbreaking was responsible for that. So he did loads of stuff and uh, we became good friends, which uh, was very, uh, had a, a, a pleasant relationship. One of the things he did for me was uh, it's a great favor. Um, I was asked to participate in a uh, two or three day uh, panel thing in DC, in the Journalist Association. And, uh, and Willis got wind of that and he uh, invited me to stay in his apartment in, in DC, uh, which was not only was very convenient because it was so close to uh, where the event was taking place, but also it, you know, it really, he was away and it was a very, uh, you know, a very nice uh, personal favor. In return for that, and I mentioned that because uh, unfortunately it was a significant element in Willis's life. He was an extraordinarily heavy, he was a chain smoker, as you will have seen in some of the photos, he's got a cigarette in his hand. So in the apartment, which was very neat and clean, there were ashtrays and the ashtrays had like a hundred years of, of, of ash deposit in them. So I decided that I was going to clean them all out. I washed them all out and they were spotless when he came back and, and he commented on that to me. Um, one thing in Willis's life that uh, was uh, a disappointment was that, in, you know, he, he as, as you mentioned, he was practically unknown in the USA. You know, he was far famous throughout the rest of the world, uh, but his Voice of America was not heard in the US. And aside from public appearances like at the Newport Jazz Festival and so on, uh, he wasn't really known. So he wanted to uh, have a radio program of his own and he had it all planned. It was going to be called Music with Friends and uh, uh, CBS was, was interested and he did uh, pilot, which uh, actually he uh, had me listen to and it was great. You know, he had such a great radio voice. It, and manner to, he was so, you know, informative and so accurate, but it wasn't pedantic. He had his own style. 
And uh, it was a mixture of, you know, authoritative and also passionate. <laughs> he just managed to be, he was an extraordinarily good interviewer. Well, anyway, this program did not work out. And it was a great disappointment to him. Uh, he was an extraordinary interviewer of musicians. And uh, one of the things that uh, I always remember, he did Louis a number of times. And uh, one, uh, one Louis interview, uh, they got to talk about, uh, I think Willis asked him something about, about Dizzy Gillespie, you know. And uh, Dizzy was Louis's neighbor in Queens. You know. Some people think because of, you know, Louis identified with a certain kind of jazz and then there's bebop and jazz critics in their own, you know, way they, uh, you know, uh, encouraged this, uh, uh, which was mostly of their own creation, was this supposed hostility between moldy figs and beboppers. But uh, whatever, they were good neighbors, Dizzy and Louis. And uh, I remember Louis telling me that uh, one late night, of course, musicians always up late, Dizzy was coming back from a gig and he you know, knocked on Louis's door and asked if he had anything to eat in the, in the refrigerator because he said when he came home, his wife had nothing. <laughs> so, uh, but in terms of Willis, Willis had uh, Louis on uh, one of the many interviews he did with Louis, and the, the conversation turned to Dizzy. I think Willis uh, intended it to go that way, and he asked uh, Louis, uh, you know, whether there was anything he put on recording that he particularly liked of of Dizzy's, and what totally floored me was that Louis picked a big band thing of Dizzy's called About to Wail, which was only issued on a mail order label thing. And I think, how come Louis does it? And it has a wonderful Gillespie solo. So that was the kind of thing that Willis managed to, to bring up. The relationship with Dave Brubeck, we know, was uh, extraordinary. And with Ellington, you went into that. Um, and, you know, with Ellington, he was responsible, uh, not, in, uh, not alone, he had help but with making Ellington's birthday uh, a major event at the White House. And that's probably the best thing Nixon ever did. You know? uh, <laughs> although he did, he actually did a few good things, uh, but, uh, well, I won't get into politics. <laughs> But uh, that event at the White House was, was an extraordinary event. And uh, I should just speaking of, this was under Nixon, of course. And uh, one of the things that happened there was that uh, um, uh, Nixon played, they did happy birthday and, and Nixon played the piano for a happy birthday. And also uh, Ellington gave Nixon uh, four kisses buses on the cheek, two on each side. And Nixon said, why four? So he said, Duke said, one for each cheek. So you guess what he meant by that. Uh, everybody has four cheeks, right? <laughs> so uh, anyway, I mean, Willis behind the scenes did so much good. And in view, of course, he did that tremendous work for jazz uh, on the Voice of America. And for things like uh, what was going on when jazz was barred in Stalinist Russia, you know, I mean, it was such a service to, uh, to musicians, what Willis did. Not only because he brought in jazz, but because he had such good taste and what he presented was so, you know, top quality. So he was a major figure, I think. He deserves more than a footnote in, in the history of jazz. Uh, he certainly was somebody who influenced, went beyond just being a broadcaster. 
So I was happy to get to know where it was. Oh, I should mention one more thing. Uh, of course, you mentioned in passing his, his marriages. And, and, uh, at Newport one year, uh, Willis came with a beautiful young woman, uh, somewhat exotic, and introduced her as his uh, fiance. And uh, uh, I would say this, off, well, well, I can't say anything off the record. I'm on the record now. Uh, my friends and I looked at each other and said, well, she, she's gorgeous, but, but we also said to each other, it's not gonna last. And it didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> But he had good taste in it. So anyway, also uh, there was an event, uh, the New Orleans Jazz Festival that Willis produced uh, turned out to be not as controversial as the Washington one on account of Holly West. But in New Orleans, there were always, you know, the New Orleans jazz world is full of uh, infighting, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, so Willis was a little bit victimized by that too, but uh, he actually had a great time and he brought in, interestingly, I remember him bringing uh, some European uh, jazz people, um, among others, a great Dutch singer named Rita Reyes brought her in. And uh, uh, one night uh, we had a party afterwards the hotel where we were all staying, and I gave you a photo. I don't know <laughs> if you showed it or not, uh, but uh, that was when Willis really relaxed. And you, you know, he, as I said, he was an army brat, and there was always a certain kind of formality uh, to him, even when he was with friends. But at that particular evening or night, because we went on into the wee hours, uh, we had some uh, now legal substance uh, that we indulged in, and he really relaxed. And <laughs> that's the most relaxed I've ever seen him. So I was very, very thankful to get to know Willis. He was quite an extraordinary man, and he did a lot of good, lasting good, because his imprint on European jazz is still, you know, it's still there. So, I would still volunteer to count ballots if you want me to. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah, th this is, uh, you know, wonder wonderful to to hear and I'm, I'm so grateful for you for your joining us today. Um, Thanks, so, for, uh, we, thanks for having me, as they say these days. <clears throat> oh yeah, yeah, and uh, and so yeah, I mean, uh, and you know, it's uh, <clears throat> I'm really happy that we can kind of uh, bookend the the presentations today uh, with uh, with you and with Jimmy Cook, who actually knew Willis Conover, because uh, oh. you know we have our, our secondary sources, but also uh, our primary sources who knew him. Yes, I wanted to ask Mr. Morgenstern if he was uh, familiar with Willis's association with the NEA. Uh, with the National Dharma for the Arts? Yes. That's correct. Yeah, I think I, I mentioned that a little bit, you know, because he, uh, yes, he, he was influential there too in making room for jazz and making more room for jazz, just like he, uh, you know, he, he managed to get more money for jazz uh, from the endowment uh, by working behind the scenes. Yes. Was he, he actually employed by the NEA? No, he was not employed. Uh, he was, you know, I mean, some people thought he was a politician. It wasn't really, but he, you know, he, he used his experience in DC and the many people he had met and gotten to know to work behind the scenes to influence things in favor of jazz. I mean, that, that's what he wanted to do. And with NEA, uh, which uh, I was a panelist for a number of years and to 
jazz started out with practically no funding at all. It was just like, you know, a, a, it was a pittance. And Willis was one of the people who put pressure on uh, political pressure. I mean, he wasn't doing it uh, uh, visibly, but from behind the scene. And there were two people, this is during Nixon administration. There were two lawyers who worked for Nixon who happened to be jazz fans. This may seem somewhat, one was Leonard Garment and the other was uh, Charlie McWhorter. And the two of them uh, and Willis were really much responsible for bringing Ellington to the White House for his birthday, but also for getting the endowment to really give some decent funding to jazz, which in the beginning was not the case at all. The classical people were prejudiced against jazz. And uh, it, took, it took some behind the scenes working uh, to get the music some proper recognition. Yes, you're mentioning that Willis is more than a footnote in terms of the importance of jazz culturally as well as uh, a means of diplomacy overseas. Um, I, I, I bristle every time I realize of all of the NEA jazz masters that there are, and yet he was never a recipient of that award. Uh, and they don't give that award to people posthumously. And they've only done it once with one person who happened to pass away before they gave it to him, uh, Bob Duro. Uh, yeah. But I, you know, I feel very uneasy to think that Willis Conover has never been considered a jazz master. Well, I absolutely agree with you. And having had that honor myself, I would say that Willis probably, you know, he deserved it more than I. But mm -hmm. I, I think when, the, what year, when, when did Willis pass away? 1996. Yeah. 96. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there was there was plenty of room. There was time to give him give him that award. Yes, he should serve. Well, I I I'm considering getting a petition of of as many NEA uh, jazz master recipients to appeal to the NEA to relent on giving him an award. Uh, not necessarily with the with the cash award because that's the reason why they only give it to. Uh, living uh, musicians and, and uh, influences, but to just give him the award posthumously uh, because he certainly deserved it. It's the yeah. same thing with the Grammy Awards. Uh, we've tried to get him uh, nominated for a Grammy and, you know, it's the whole kind of prejudice against him because he wasn't a musician. No. But yet, I, I can, I, I know personally Grammy winners who would not have been Grammy winners had it not been for the importance and influence of Willis Conover. Right, right. So yeah. that, you know, those two things need to be considered and, you know, I, I'm going to work on it as much as I can. I'm Hopefully you... with some some results by April 25th of 2021, oh. which is Willis oh, Conover. Oh, good, good, good. If I can be of any help, let me know, because I, I still know a few people at the endowment, although many of them I knew were gone. Fantastic. I, okay. that's, that's great. That's great. But I will you, be in touch. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, another you know, in, inexplicable omission that a lot of people apparently you know, tried to resolve before, before Hanover died because he was, in, you know, he was in declining health for really the the decade before his death is, is the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And that's, that's yes. another one, uh, mm -hmm. even posthumously, that's, that's been baffling over the years as, as to why it, it wasn't considered. Uh, uh, and uh, Matt, Matt Snyder in, in the chat mentioned the stamp. And that was actually um, in 2015, um, Marie Silberti was a, also a driving force behind that effort. And uh, I was uh, honored to assist and uh, Someone thankfully brought it to the attention of, of Doug Ramsey, the, the jazz writer, uh, and he 
you know, he uh, got an article in, in the Wall Street Journal about, about the stamp effort. And uh, there were some others. There was a, in very interesting and diverse places, a memory serves and NPR had one and Reason Magazine also, mm -hmm. also had one. And um, I did get a response from the Postal Service saying they would consider it, but you know, never heard anything more. But there was a you oh. know, there was a good little groundswell for that. That's right, the stamp. Oh man! Well, we still have time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, my it's a, goodness! It's not a... <laughs> yeah, we got to work on that. Awesome. Yeah, Fantastic. but yeah, the Presidential Medal of, of Freedom has always has always been a baffling one. In in the course of my research, I even requested his, you know, Conover's FBI file, since you know, posthumously, there's no there's no privacy concerns, and uh, you know, got the response that uh, sorry, we got nothing. So, you know, there's yeah. no, I wouldn't I wouldn't think so. I mean that uh, yes yes, but you know, you're right. I mean, all these things should have happened. Uh, he certainly was a worthy recipient. The Medal of Freedom. Uh, I mean, I don't mind other people got it, but uh, I think he would be ahead of a number of them. Yes. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting too, the musicians that are at the peak of, of their ability today, like Igor Bootman, um, Joey Alexander from Indonesia, uh, a teen prodigy at, the, at jazz piano, attributes his learning jazz from listening to the recordings that his dad made of Willis's programs. Uh, Igor Budman, you know, who was playing when Willis was alive. He played at festivals that Willis uh, hosted in Europe. And he attributes his ability to continue on. And, you know, Willis gave him words of encouragement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he's just, he's just a fabulous musician and band leader. Uh, he may be he may be in his middle age, but he plays like a young man, uh, <laughs> you know. So the the influence is still there after all of these decades. You know, we have a seventeen year old piano prodigy who attributes his uh, knowledge of jazz to Willis. So it's still going. It's it's still going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still growing. Yeah, and that, that comes back to, you know, the, the idea of Willis Conover as, as this thread running through jazz history. You know, you, you pull on the thread and all of these things come out connected to it. Yeah. The, the story with uh, Ruth Brown. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, the rhythm and blues artist who they call Atlantic Records the house that Ruth built. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and... In her book, she recalls that Ellington was at the club that same night that Willis introduced her to Ahmed Erdogan. Mm -hmm. um, and so he basically initiated the launch of her career with Atlantic Records. And, you know, needless to say, they exploited her, but the revenue that her record sales generated just put Atlantic Records on the map. Uh, and allowed them to acquire a lot of other great musicians, including Ray Charles. Uh, they already had a contract with Charles Brown, uh, the famous rhythm and blues artist who, who influenced Ray Charles, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so, so again, that's, that's Willis, uh, Willis's influence. Uh, Grammy winner Arturo Sandoval from Cuba. Um, Inspired by Willis, singularly inspired by Willis uh, and his programs. He listened to them. He annotated solos so that he could learn how to play from listening to Willis's programs. Um, spent four years in military prison for listening to Willis. Um, hmm. But there you go. He's a Grammy winner. He wouldn't be a Grammy winner <laughs> had it not been for the stuff that he learned from Willis Conover. 
So I, I have a feeling we could go we could go for a while on the number of Grammy winners who owe their success to Willis Connolly. Yes, I'm sure did. there's yeah. numerous. Yes. Um, anyone with a European background, yeah, or mm -hmm. Latin. Uh, Latin American, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as you say, I mean, it's still a living thing. So many people who are still there, um, who were inspired. Yeah, and who can, yeah. right, and give testimony to his, to his importance. Nils Landolke in Denmark, you know, uh, great mm -hmm. piano player who also owns a club in uh, Copenhagen. He also oh. was very much influenced by Voice of America by Willis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, <laughs> there's few of us <laughs> left <clears throat> to to champion this man's importance not only to America, but to the rest of the world. And uh, we're gonna have to start kicking up some dust around, <laughs> around Washington to yeah. uh, get this man his, his uh, deserved recognition. Yeah, I think a posthumous Jazz Masters Award, I think should be, should be possible, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, let's try, okay. <laughs> Certainly, I um, I met the owner of uh, the Keystone Corner, who who's also uh, a a jazz master recipient. Uh, so we have a few people who might be able to sign on to a petition to uh, to get this done for Willis. Good, let's let's do. You know, it. there's a. a a jazz program that comes on Thursday nights on the PB, not the PBS, but the Pacifica radio station uh, on Thursday nights. And he opens his show with a quote of Willis's actual voice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I tried to get him involved with this project, but it's almost as if he's playing that because he heard it somewhere but it's like he doesn't know who Willis is, uh, uh, uh. which is really amazing. I mean, that's, you know, that's, it's shocking. But his influence is still there. Indeed, yes. Shall, shall I continue, Maristella? I, I, it happens to everybody. I uh, needed to unmute myself there. Uh, I wanted to, to follow up on a, on a couple things there. Um, for one, I, I did find the uh, the names of the Hungarian musicians. Um, there's uh, Ivan, Ivan, I'm going to do my best with the pronunciation, but I Ivan Zagon, uh, Gabor Radic, uh, Lajos Kabok, Ferenc Rutka, uh, as I mentioned before, there was uh, Gabor Zabo and looking for other additional names, uh, uh, Gyula Kovac, uh, Yorgi Varady, uh, Tibor Tomka, uh, Ervin Va Vasundi, and I think that's all, all of the names, but yes, the, the embassy did wonderful work in uh, in tra tracking down the people. And then uh, uh, Francesca Martinelli asked if the people in, in the Tallinn picture had been identified and uh, not, not at this time that I'm, that I'm aware of. Uh, Cause yeah, it would be interesting to see who, who, was, who was there with them getting, getting autographs. But uh, of course uh, that event also included Char Charles Lloyd and, and his band. And uh, I do have the, the photo that, that Dan sent me. I, I pulled that up, so I'll, I'll share my screen. And um, let's see. I can share the. So you can see, yeah, Willis, uh, Willis kicking back, and there's a second <laughs> from left is Shirley Connor, wow. his, his fourth wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is a. 
That is just one one for the ages. <laughs> and yeah, that's a, a yeah, and it was a yeah, it was a great event. We do have one performance in our digital library from from the festival, and for a while at least there was a, there was a segment on on YouTube from from the event. So uh, so yeah, yeah. There's a I forget the name of the city, but the other great drunk Willis story was uh, Willis going to vineyards in uh, <clears throat> in Hungary, I think in, in connection with the Debert's and Jazz Days. And I uh, forget the, the name of the winery and or the, the city, but he was making a pun on it and saying whatever it was is all right. So the name of the thing is all right. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, for, for someone, you know, that that reserved and the, you know, I think you could compare them to Ellington in terms of the, the boundary between public and private persona. So when that, that boundary came down, it, it's a you know, remarkable thing to see. <laughs> nice. so, was uh, it Dubrovnik? Was it Dubrovnik? I think it, it was uh, it was Debrecen where where that one happened uh, in uh -huh. far east far east in Hungary. Yeah. You know the the story you told about Duke Ellington kissing uh, him on the cheek is is this is the same story that Larry Willis told me about when he met Ellington, that he kissed him. <laughs> four times, twice on each cheek, and so that's one for each cheek. It was so <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Nixon never got it. He didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> it, went, it went right past it right over his head. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> that, that video is, is also, uh, video from that night is also on YouTube. It was a uh, Put together, I think, by the USIA as a as a documentary at the time. Of, yeah. Uh, Whoa. Yeah, kind of a. I a didn't monster. know that. I have to find that. Yeah. Oh yeah, because uh, you know, and you know, it's fun to see that that side of, of Nixon, where he's you know he calls out the key of G and and plays the plays Happy Birthday for for Duke Ellington. It was a wonderful <laughs> party, and when we left. Uh, my friends and I were about the, among the last to leave. Uh, when we left, uh, the, uh, uh, the guy at the door when we, when we left the White House uh, said that uh, he had been working there for many, many years. And this was the greatest evening ever and also the longest. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. Wow, amazing. Yeah, but yeah. If if you search YouTube for Duke Ellington White House birthday, there's a, a fifteen and a half minute full video, and then a couple clips of uh, of Nick Nixon playing Happy Birthday. Yeah. Wow. I look Just for put that. it out in the chat. Yeah, we do have it at the National Archives. We have some footage of that event. So. Oh yeah, it, that's epic. It wasn't only Nixon who played piano. Though. You remember Agnew? Agnew played piano too, and he was. Surprisingly good. <laughs> wow. wow. He was. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nixon was not too great on happy birthday, but Agnew was, uh, it was a surprise. Wow. Hmm. Amazing. I knew that about Spiro. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a question from, from Keith in, in the chat uh, about Countover's uh, meticulous research and uh, uh, any assistance for his fan mail, and you know, as mentioned earlier, he kept that that mailbox at the the Rosslyn station, uh, later, you know, now part of the the DC Metro, with a with the post office boxes also also in that that complex. And so, you know, he was you know very very uh, reluctant to give out his residential addresses. And I think it was ninety one twenty two Rosslyn station. Uh, was his, uh, you know, his mailing address for mm -hmm. decades, and they would send someone out there with a mailbag to to round it up. I did, I, I need to visit sometime. I need to find the mailboxes and visit to see the size of the, the mailbox. But 
they would send someone out there to to gather it up. But yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, now that you mention it, you know, when I was staying at his place in D.C., he had asked me not to tell anyone tell. Mm. where it was. No. And he was at the at the coronet for a number of years. And is is that now the uh, the Capitol Hill Hotel? I think so. It must yeah. be. Yeah. So. Uh, it's yeah, in I've southwest stayed, yeah i've stayed there and I've, I've always wondered you know if if they were indeed the same the same structure if i if i had stayed in willis's willis's <laughs> former flat well that whole area has been rebuilt oh yeah um yeah uh, but that hotel is still there oh yeah 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 because when i google the the former address for the coronet it comes back as a uh, as Cap Capitol Hill Hotel, and then uh, of course uh, mm -hmm. now now it can be told the 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 New York address for years, which I think he he parted ways with uh, as part of his his fourth divorce settlement was two two seven Central Park West. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. That's a sweet sweet looking building. Can imagine. Yeah, but as, can, as far as the can... as the fan mail, I'm I'm sure there was a. There was some there was some assistance because uh, there there's evidence in the collection where things were kind of uh, you know outsourced or passed on to be addressed and then uh, of course there were uh, in amateur radio they're called QSL cards that that confirm receipt of a of a signal sent out to people so they there was some staff involvement there and then especially with mm. the uh, Friends of Music USA also but it's a we have some fan mail in the collection and I, I gather he kept what he was proud of and may have also wanted to keep as evidence of the effectiveness of his program. But there's, a, I'm sure there's a lot that, you know, I don't know where, where it might've gone in the, in, in the ins institutional uh, system. And it could still be at the archives. Oh yeah. Yeah, the National Archives. I have yet to go out there and and wade in the Willis Conover content that they have. I'm so glad yeah. we'll get to hear about it later because yeah, it's a it's deep. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I, I haven't come across a fan mail yet. I work at the archives and uh, but I'll keep my eye out for it. Uh, don't know if that was saved as a permanent record or not. So that's that's part of the issue. But we can talk about that later too. Interesting. And yeah, and it, the fan mail come, came from everywhere because you know radio, radio waves don't stop at national boundaries, even though the program was initially uh, intended for for the so the Soviet Union and its sphere of influence. And you know they were getting reception reports and fan mail from from Guatemala, from uh, from India, from uh, West Africa, and uh, you know some of them saying you know it's after midnight in my time zone or at some inconvenient time. And so by spring of 1956, the, the program went worldwide and had a, a broader broadcast schedule so that it, that it was hitting, hitting those other time zones at a, at a mm -hmm. convenient time. Yeah, I read somewhere that at one time he was reaching over 500 million people a week. Oh yeah, yeah, the, the reach just was, was just phenomenal. Staggering. Yeah. Yeah, that's an amazing number. Yeah. Really, thirty million a <laughs> night is, is is an amazing number. <laughs> right. Really. Yeah, and even even when it was jammed, uh, I remember Marie Silverti talking about this. Uh, people would find, you know, like you know, behind that garage over there, there's a break in the jamming, and you can listen. And uh, mm -hmm. people would people would find the, the gaps in in the jamming. Mm -hmm. I really miss Marie. Um, she was really a good friend of mine for a while. I was a representative of our union yeah. and she was also a representative for AFGE. And we shared an awful lot of meetings together uh, with management and, you know, and unions meeting together. We, we struggled uh, in, the, in the 90s and things became a little bit easier to understand and clearer during the Clinton administration because they put into place this labor management partnership. 
you know, all of it was met with great skepticism, but every once in a while, a ray of light would come through and we would exploit it with everything that we had <laughs> to try and get things moving for the employees. And uh, so we, 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 we paneled a lot together uh, in those meetings. So uh, yeah, Marie, Marie is my heart. Oh yeah. She is, she is my solidarity heart. Oh yeah, one, one in a million. Yes, indeed, absolutely. I came to find out that one of my neighbors right across the street from me was a friend of hers. And I didn't know it until, you know, about maybe five years before she passed away. So yeah. that gave me a reason to go and visit the neighbor a little bit more often. <laughs> nice, yeah. You yeah, know, so somebody, somebody that's smart and yet sweet who <clears throat> didn't have an easy upbringing uh, she had to sacrifice the childhood for quite a few of her younger years. The reason why I know that is because my wife had a similar kind of upbringing and I had a hard time understanding it. Uh, my wife is uh, Ukrainian American. She was born here in the United States, but her, and, and her parents were, but her grandparents came here from, Pol from Poland. To Pennsylvania. And so I had a hard time understanding the cultural impacts in, the, in terms of our relationship. And Marie, boy, Marie put everything into perspective for me. She really supported me in the early stages of our marriage and having Ooh. children and all of that. That's how close we became. And, um, you know, she's just, a, like you said, one of a kind. Oh, yeah. One of a kind. And so people in Russia know Marie. <laughs> Because she hosted the, the program uh, for the Russian service. Oh, yeah. And conversations with Conover for, for the mm -hmm. for Russian audiences. Yes. So, um, again, uh, a person that deserves more recognition. Yeah. And one, you know, wonderful discussion. And, you know, to be able to share so, so many mem memories today is, a, you know, a, a, I think, a great tribute to, to Willis. I mean, you know, coming up on, on 25 years after his death, but he still, you know, inspires this, this kind of, uh... Mm -hmm. well, it was, it was great to uh, participate. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, and thank, thank you so much. This is uh, so wonderful.